I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what it's like, what it's like to fly in space. Um, I uh, I grew up wanting to fly in space. You know, I grew up at the time of Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and John Glenn, you know, and we all wanted to fly in space at that time, and I just never stopped wanting to. So um, I worked for NASA for 37 years total, 17 of those years I was an astronaut. Been at UC Davis as a professor now for nine years, um, helping new young minds enter the uh, the world of space flight and make this make this make this race a better race than we uh, have been before by going to space and learning things we never could have known about our bodies, about technology, and about the Earth and the solar system. So let's talk a little bit about um, flight. I guess what got me into being excited about space flight is it was the ultimate flying. I've always been fascinated with flying. As an astronaut, I get to fly these beautiful jets, these uh, T-38 jets, uh, supersonic uh, two place um, Air Force trainers are still in use by the Air, Fo Air Force and by NASA. Wonderful aircraft. But of course, you don't start flying things like that. You start flying things that you can afford when you're a teenager, like that. <laughs> so I started, started out actually in 1969 flying hang gliders and uh, somehow survived that period of my life. I've been flying various things ever since. The whole thing about flying is safety. And that, involves knowing something about the human body, the human behavioral process under stress, under fear, under, under threat. And this is why astronauts fly high performance airplanes is to be in an appropriate um, environment in which your, your actions have real world consequences. It's a, it's a great way to keep your, keep your mindset uh, uh, sharp and your dynamic decision-making um, uh, up to speed to get ready for that space flight that you're going to take where you never know what's going to happen. It's also about teamwork. Doing anything complex and dangerous um, usually requires teamwork, whether you're in an um, emergency room situation, whether you're flying an airplane, whether you're in space, whether you're climbing. And uh, many of the things that you do in our audience requires teamwork in that, and you know what that, that involves. You have to understand a lot about yourself, and you have to be a great follower. Never, not everybody gets to be a leader all the time, so knowing how to be a follower is the key to teamwork. Let's talk about the space shuttle program a little bit. All the space shuttles are in museums, but everything we do in space from now on owes a lot to the people and the organizations that ran the space shuttle program for an awful lot of years. Um, when I started with NASA, I, I was working in a group that um, well, the space shuttle hadn't flown yet. And I was working in a group and we were trying to figure out how hot is the space shuttle gonna get as it enters the atmosphere? <laughs> Seems like a fundamental question. It was actually extremely difficult and complex. It lasted for 30 years. And it functioned as America's space construction truck. It's not all it did. Um, anything that lasts for 30 years, you, you end up using it for things that you never intended <laughs> to use it for in the first place. There were five of them built. Three of them survived the program. Um, they all look identical. They weren't exactly identical. Um, but the, the way that the space shuttles evolved over their lifetime was that uh, it was turned out to be really clever. I'm not sure it was designed this way, but this was very clever. Where you had a you had an integrated hardware and and software environment with a crew that knew how to how to operate it and how to um, how to analyze what was going on with it. But you overlaid NASA overlaid a constantly changing layer of new technology, new sensors, new computers, new capabilities. So over the three decades that the shuttle was operational. The, uh, its, its capabilities changed drastically, even though the shuttle itself and its flight hard, uh, software didn't really change very much at all. 135 missions, four of which I got to have the privilege of going on. Yeah, let me tell you, everyone who's ever been in space has felt like they were the luckiest person ever born. Because yes, it takes lots of work and dedication and, and some maybe some genetic blessings, but it also takes fortune, good fortune, being at the right place at the right time. So four missions, you work uh, very close together 
uh, on a crew. And uh, you're, you're a very special uh, type of team. Those of you who have worked in hazardous environments in the military or in medical environments know how uh, shared risk can bond you together like nothing else can. So by the time you fly with your, uh, with your space crew, you know each other in ways that probably nobody else actually does. Um, which is important and invaluable because you, you're counting on each other for, uh, for, for your lives, really. My job in the space shuttle was to sit in the seat that looked at all this. I was the flight engineer, which meant my job was to be very, um, have very intimate knowledge of all of the different subsystems inside the space shuttle and how they work together, how they could fail. And what kind of indications are there when, if and when they start degrading or failing? And then, you know, I sort of, the job as a flight engineer is ask, well, what's the next worst thing that can happen? And what can you do to stop that from occurring? Space shuttle is extremely complex. So it was a learning job. And I, I just think I was in the books basically every day of my 17 years as, a, as an astronaut study, studying, which I thought was a wonderful thing to, to be paid to do. The shuttle is a, you know, if you have eyes for aerodynamics, is, is, is a beautiful machine, actually. And uh, the night before launch, when it's sitting out there on the pad ready to go, uh, has, has a, a real special meaning for anybody who had anything to do with it. And believe me, that was thousands upon thousands of people. So the, those of us who got to actually ride up the elevator across the catwalk and get inside that machine and take it into space felt the um, kind of the spirit of all those different thousands of people coming right along with us again it's about safety you know if you really want to be safe flying in space you don't fly in space you just stay home <laughs> flying in space is not safe so the question is how much risk can you really stand how much risk can you put up with are you willing to put up with? And, you know, we, we did things that, um, to try to be safe that we realized weren't going to be very likely to be helpful, but um, we still wore a parachute. We still wore, uh, you know, an inflation, inflated um, water flotation devices. You can see that around my chest there. Um, the spacesuit is kind of an interesting thing. There's two different kinds of spacesuit, one for going outside and one for wearing on the inside. That orange suit is for wearing on the inside of the space shuttle uh, for launch and for descent, for coming home. In case you lose pressurization on the inside, it can puff up like Pillsbury Doughboy and keep you alive in there. Um, you've got a liquid cooled underwear. You can kind of see those blue sleeves. You can almost see those little tubes, tubes of water. But, uh, or a, a pump pumps cool water through the tubes and keeps your body cool because that suit can get really hot, especially if you're moving around. Launch is uh, like nothing else I've ever experienced. Been flying airplanes my whole life. Lots of uh, lots of different kinds of experiences, including you know jet fighters and um, but there is nothing remotely like the sustained acceleration of a shuttle launch. This is what it looks like when you're. When you're on the inside, you've got the pilot on the right, the commander on the left, and uh, the flight engineer sitting right in the middle where I took this picture. Going up through the atmosphere is, um, is quite a rock and roll ride. When you're close to the ground, it's quite violent because you're getting a lot of reflected sound waves. But after, um, and sound waves are just pressure waves, so it bounces around the shuttle a lot as you're, um, when you're close to the ground. But after 43 seconds, you're going supersonic and pressure waves can't catch up with you anymore. So it's a little bit smoother. Um, the whole idea is to go up and then turn and go fast. When you're in orbit, you're going about 17,500 miles per hour um, relative to the surface of the Earth. And so that's, you know, you know if, you, if, it, if you could make it into a Mach number, of course, there's no air up there. But um, if it were a Mach number, it would be a little above Mach 25. So you are really moving out. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to expend to get the hardware and the people going at that velocity. So in the first eight seconds, you're going 100 miles an hour. Now, this is 
super impressive. It would be an impressive if you had a car that could do that. And some cars can. No car I've ever owned could, but <laughs> but this is about the size and mass of a 20-story building going straight up. And in eight seconds, it's going 100 miles an hour. 43 seconds, Mach 1. One minute, Mach 1 and a half. Now, after one minute, you're about the height of an airliner and going about 50% faster than an airliner. Two minutes later, you're at 155,000 feet going Mach 4. Four minutes later, it's Mach 7 and a half, 300 something thousand feet. Then you start going fast. <laughs> but what happens is you can see the altitude is not changing very much. The shuttle would turn over on its back and you would pitch out over the Atlantic Ocean, just going like stink because you needed to go fast. Why? Because is there gravity in orbit? Is there gravity in orbit? Of course there is, which means you'll fall. But if you're going fast enough, you will fall towards the center of the Earth, but you'll never hit the Earth because you're going too fast. And you're constantly kind of going over the edge of it. That's what orbit really is. You're constantly under the influence of gravity, but you're never actually hitting the Earth. And to do that, these are the kind of speeds you have to go. Once you get up into space, the space shuttle would open those doors. There's a, that that uh, volume in the back is called the payload bay. The payload is whatever you're bringing with you. And the payload bay doors open up, um, not always just to access what's in there, but because they have radiators on them. And when you generate heat inside the space shuttle with any kind of electrical system, you have to um, have a way of getting rid of the excess heat. You can't just open the window. So that's what those uh, payload bay doors actually are, those silvery things you see. And you can see a payload bay there, or a payload there. Uh, on one of the missions I was on. This is a piece of the International Space Station. And one of the things, one of the most amazing things I think humans have ever been able to do is uh, is spacewalking, being outside in space. So it takes, it's a very physical activity. So you, you exercise a lot. Those, those darn flight medicine people make you exercise and exercise. <laughs> you wear um, very stylish clothing. Again, uh, liquid cooled long underwear. Under, under your suit, you get to carry really cool tools like this uh, torque driver here, battery powered torque driver. Getting in the suit is, is quite, the, uh, quite the limbo dance. You, get, you put the pants on, which have feet built right into them, and then you lumber over to this rack where, the, where your, kind of your shirt is. That it's called the hard upper torso, and it's, it's basically like a I don't know, like a, somewhere between a straight jacket and a, and a kind of a barrel shaped thing made of fiberglass and titanium and aluminum. And you squish down under it and then you wiggle up in there, pushing your arms up and into the, into the sleeves there, pop out the top. And then the suit gets connected at your waist. You put, get a helmet put, put on you there. And, and as many gloves as you have hands. <laughs> I used about half that many. The gloves are connected. And as you can imagine, um, these are complicated contraptions. The seals have to keep the air inside and not go out into the blackness of space or into the water. But they also have to allow your hands and and legs and wrists and waist uh, to rotate. So they have to be able to move and yet be extremely well sealed. Got cameras and lights on your helmet. And for training, you would go down underwater and spend about six hours down under there practicing what you're gonna do in space. And this was, the reason we would do this underwater is because there's plenty, the same amount of gravity underwater, but all the stuff you had, including yourself, you could make neutrally buoyant so it didn't sink or float and that's about as close as you can get to being in space didn't feel much like it um, actually but it was it was good practice to get the mechanical use of all the tools and moving yourself around moving yourself around is a big deal because you and the spacesuit and all your tools can weigh maybe up to 600 pounds and you're moving around 600 pounds for six hours with your arms that tires you out there's a mission control. 
there's lots of divers to keep uh, keep tabs on on your on your progress to help you with tools to keep you safe. Um, they saved my my bacon one day when I blew out the waist ring of the suit and the suit started filling with water. And um, between the bubbles and the water and the pressure and everything else, I couldn't speak and I couldn't hear and I couldn't see. And I sunk to the bottom like a rock, 40 foot, 40 feet down and filling up with water, you know, a certain ending. <laughs> and all the divers in the pool went and rescued me and saved my life. So they're pretty much my favorite people. Um, you carry around kind of like Home Depot strapped to your chest, you know, all the tools you need. You just know where you're going to get any more tools or supplies. You have to figure all that out ahead of time and take them with you. There is the crew of divers. They're great people. And <laughs> one of the most uh, memorable things I can remember of going out the hatch the first time on my first spacewalk, or we call them EVAs, went out the hatch and looked around. And there's no divers. It was lonely. We work in twos. We work in pairs. It's a buddy system. Just makes sense. If you've been a diver or climber or just about anything else, buddy system just makes sense. My buddy um, for the mission in which I did spacewalks was um, Suichi Noguchi, a Japanese astronaut who happens to be on the International Space Station right now. This is the airlock. Now, when you go outside, you don't just open the door. All the air would get out. So you go into a little phone booth size thing and close the door behind you pump the air out of that phone booth back into the space station or the space shuttle, and then go out the, that hatch. <laughs> you can see a homemade tool in my right hand here. Uh, so much of the space program is extremely high tech, except when you have to make a tool yourself. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Here's Suichi, my spacewalk buddy. And that's what it looks like in the airlock when you're both in there. You're basically, you know, chest to chest. It's pretty crowded. And it seems even more crowded because you can't see very well. Um, that helmet is stationary. So if you move your head around on the inside, the helmet doesn't move with it. So there's very limited in your view. It's easy to get tangled up and you need each other to stay untangled and safe. Once you go outside, you can see those wires there. You are tethered. It's not good, does not show good style to float away into space. And so it's good to have these, uh, these cable tethers. Um, and all your tools are also tethered to you, which sounds like a great idea until they get all tangled up like a spider's web and you have these giant big inflated oven mitts on and you're trying to under, untangle all your tangled tools. <laughs> Every spacewalker's got experience with that. But it's an almost indescribable experience and environment to be in. You know, you can see the entire universe out there, one through a quarter inch piece of plexiglass in your helmet. And this is um, this is uh, Suichi in his suit with me taking a picture with the very first digital camera ever taken outside on a spacewalk. And it just fell to us to do that, which was pretty cool. You move around with, we call them spacewalks, but you don't walk at all. You really use mostly your hands to move around, move your hands and your arms, which can be extremely physically demanding. Also mentally demanding. It's a, you know, it's a very busy, thoughtful job in which you have to plan everything you do. We had a problem with the space shuttle on one of my missions where the, the heat shield during launch had vibrated loose some parts and was sticking out of the bottom of the heat shield and they were gonna generate some very dangerous hot spots on the heat shield that we were afraid would not um, allow us to come home safely. So that set up the scene for kind of an emergency spacewalk where we had to go out and get those things. So I went out on the robot arm, which was kind of the ride of your life, to go to the bottom of the space shuttle Discovery. Discovery is now on the National Air and Space Museum uh, Dulles Airport, Washington, D.C. But I got a view of it no one had ever had before in space, and nobody ever, ever did afterwards either, and uh, of, of the tiles, and actually reached out 
and pulled out the offending pieces um, that had vibrated loose and got a great selfie with the tiles in the background with this brand new digital camera. And you know, some things you just can't help doing. It's a beautiful shot of discovery. And you can see up there just above the word discovery, it's attached, that's how and where it attaches to the International Space Station. You can see the, uh, the heat shield tiles, you can see the small, the ports for the small rocket engines that allows the shuttle to uh, change its attitude, its angle in the sky. Um, well, the space station, uh, hopefully you, you, you know quite a bit about the space station, so we won't talk about it too much, but um, I do want to show it to you as, a, as, a, as an orbiting scientific laboratory. We're all, I think everybody on this call is trained as some sort of scientist, including me. And um, so it's a very unique and challenging constrained with, uh, with aspects. When you look at the space station, you see all these things sticking out and you know that the solar arrays, right? But they're not all solar arrays. The bold looking ones are, but these ones here, remember on the shuttle on the, on the payload bay doors, they were, um, I told you that they were radiators. These are the radiators for the space station sticking out here. And the way they work is on the inside of the space station where the people are, you're using all kinds of, um, you know, computers and machinery, and, you know, fans and pumps and things like that. They all generate waste heat. That waste heat is transferred into um, uh, pipes of water. And that water takes the heat to a heat exchanger that exchanges that heat, transfers that heat from the water to a um, ammonia. <laughs> Why ammonia? That's dangerous, it's toxic. Well, it doesn't stay inside, it goes outside because it won't freeze. Water will freeze right away. Ammonia won't in the coldness of space. So that ammonia carries that heat out to these radiators. And uh, that's, and the heat is just radiated out into the, into the blackness of space. And that's, so that is how weight heat, waste heat is actually uh, dealt with on, on a spacecraft, or at least at this spacecraft. The research environment, uh, we talked about the fact that you're going, you're going fast and actually not that high, 400 kilometers is not that high, but you're going around the earth every 90 minutes. The inclination means that a uh, zero degree inclination would mean it was going um, around the equator. It's not, it's a tipped up orbital plane so that it can go over both the United States and Russia so that launches from either country could uh, could reach the International Space Station. Of course, it is international. The main way that um, people have gotten there are either by space shuttle or Soyuz, or now very recently, the, uh, the uh, Crew Dragon uh, from SpaceX. It's a microgravity environment. It's um, in free fall all the time. So it's a wonderful place to study um, fluid dynamics and heat transfer without uh, physical attributes that you find in a gravitational environment. So here, surface tension is very important. Um, you don't have the normal uh, convection. You know, heat, heat doesn't rise in space so, or in this environment, so you don't have the normal convection cells, really cells. Multi-phase flow can be very interesting because you don't get the same kind of mixing. Um, and so on. Um, combustion is really interesting. Doesn't work the same at all. And so uh, flame quenching and flame propagation are very, very different physics in this different gravitational environment. But also your body changes. And I'm not gonna talk too much about that because we're gonna hear lots about that in the next talk. It was a big project putting this thing together. 115 space flights. It's very large, it's over a million pounds of stuff. If it were still on the ground, it would be larger than a football field. Here's a scale. That's just the, the rotating hub of two of the solar arrays. And you can see that little figure up there, that's Suichi picture I took of them just for uh, to show a reference of how big things are. 
took about 12 years, 37 shuttle missions, 199 space blocks, and it includes a um, kind of a complex of 15 pressurized modules. It was not put together by robots. It was put together by people, piece by piece by piece, even the big chunks. So you would fly a space shuttle up to the International Space Station, dock with it, and then a robot arm would reach out and take the big module that was in the space shuttle and remove it and plug it into the space station. But how do you think that robot arm was, was commanded? By a human with a control stick in each hand. It was done entirely manually. The rest of the details were put together by people on the inside working with tools and people on the outside working with tools. And this is how the space station went, went together so successfully. No part had to be brought home again because it didn't work or didn't fit over 12 years of construction. I wish that were true on our construction projects here on Earth. So using tools in space is kind of interesting because um, when you're torquing a bolt or something like that, how do you know who's going to turn, you or the bolt? <laughs> in the microgravity environment, you have to anchor yourself. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the research that this kind of plays into in a university environment. In this case, UC Davis and my research lab have about 25 students, a mix of PhD, masters, and undergraduate students. One of the things we've been looking at for several years is the idea of a space ambulance. What if you have a serious injury or illness on the space station and you need to get home? Well, up until very recently, your option was to come home on the Soyuz, which is a pretty violent ride and land, lands um, kind of in the middle of nowhere in Kazakhstan. And uh, so we decided to look, um, a bunch of students have been involved in this, to look at a, um, a space plane that's been flying for several years without people on it. It was actually not built to have people on it. So we kind of repurposed the design to make it into a space ambulance. Now this X-37B is an Air Force um, project, but it has an interesting heritage. It started, NASA designed it in the first place and then never finished it, went on to do other things. You see, it looks like a tiny little space shuttle. It kind of works a similar way. It has wings, launches vertically, comes back on its wings, lands on a runway, but it's an entirely robotic ship. He took the design and changed it. It's about how big it is and what it looks like. Changed it to accommodate a crew of three for an emergency ride back down from the ISS to, uh, to a landing strip that was in close proximity to advanced medical facilities. So the idea was to return an injured crew uh, back in within about three hours. So the first thing we had to figure out is, well, how many people need to go? The injured person, yes. Somebody to take care of them, a crew medical officer, yes. And um, it will be autonomously landing a uh, space plane. But there really needs to be a backup pilot because something like this has never been done before. And if things don't go right, you don't want this bad day to go even worse. So you need a pilot, a crew medical officer, and, and appropriate space and equipment for the patient. And the first question we had is, could we really fit three people into this little thing? And the answer is sure. So we developed, um, we had to do a lot of different things. We had to take the systems that are in the X-37B, completely resize them and place them differently. We did all the analysis on that. We had to add life support systems. So environmental control and life support to keep three humans alive in, a, in an enclosed pressurized module like you see here. It's actually uh, very complex, requires a lot of different subsystems and monitoring. So we, uh, we settled on this configuration where the pilot's up front. The patient is in green, uh, supine, but, and, the, uh, and the crew medical officer in red is kind of sitting so that that crew medical officer can rotate just about under the patient. So the patient is almost in their lap. So you have access to the upper torso and the head. This is hard to see really, but um, 
because it's transparent, but it's a full scale mock-up of that pressurized compartment. So I think it's 14 feet long and four feet in diameter. Easily fits uh, three people. There's much more to say about that, but um, I just wanted to give you a teaser. The Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser is, um, is under development right now as a cargo vehicle to ISS. But of course, we've been talking to them also about maybe that could be a future medical evacuation vehicle for future spacecraft. So we currently have a, um, a crew of uh, students working on this project. And we've recently been funded by NASA to take some of our technology in support of this and test it in, a, in an airplane that flies a big parabola in the sky. And as it goes over the top of the hump, you get about 30 seconds of microgravity uh, free fall. So uh, our students are gonna take uh, the technology that we've been developing. That technology, I'll just tell you about it since I have just a second here, speaks to this interesting problem. When you've been in space for a while, your balance system is adjusted to the microgravity environment, which is there's no gravity vector uh, to serve as a reference for your body orientation. Um, when you start coming back into gravity, it can make you very dizzy. It can be very uh, provocative. It can make you sick, make, give you motion sickness. Um, so the more you have to move your head around while you're coming into gravity, the more prone you are to becoming ill, and then you're not going to be very functional. Well, if you are the crew medical officer, and this is happening to you, um, there's a chance that you may become the second patient on the vehicle, <laughs> on the ambulance, and this is not good. So what we've done is developed a, uh, an inertial measurement unit that is worn on your head and gives you a visual, a very subtle peripheral visual cue, where if you're moving your head too quickly or accelerating too quickly to give you um, kind of real-time uh, training inputs, to keep your head motions limited and damped to reduce your chance of getting sick. So this is what we're gonna test in the, in the Zero-G airplane uh, starting next November. Uh, the work we've done so far, the theses, I won't read those titles, but we've been looking at the systems, the crew configuration, the medical equipment um, uh, on board, and the environmental control and life support systems. You have one article uh, out with the folks from the UC Davis Department of Emergency Medicine. It says this is an ongoing project, one of, one of many at UC Davis. Much more to talk about, but I think I'll leave it right there with UC Davis Aggies in space.